Chapter Ten of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter Ten. Adrift. Archie rode along in a dream. He had gone straight out of the garden, taken his horse from the stable, and ridden back to Forfar, following the blind resolution to escape from Ardguys before he should have time to realize what it was costing him. He had changed horses at the posting house and turned his face along the way he had come. Through his pain and perplexity, the only thing that stood fast was his determination not to return to Balnillo. I will go now, he had said to Madame Flemington, and he had gone without another word, keeping his very thoughts within the walled circle of his resolution, lest they should turn to look at familiar things that might thrust out hands full of old memories to hold him back. In the middle of his careless life he found himself cut adrift without warning from those associations that he now began to feel he had valued too little, taken for granted too much. Balnillo was impossible for him, and in consequence he was to be a stranger in his own home. Madame Flemington had made no concession and had put no term to his banishment, and though he could not believe that such a state of things could last, and that one sudden impulse of hers could hurl him out of her life for ever, she who had lived for him had told him that she would do without him. Then, as he assured himself of this from that dim recess wherein a latent truth hides until some outside light flashes upon its lair, came the realization that she had not lived for him alone. She had lived for him that she might make him into the instrument she desired, a weapon fashioned to her hand, wherewith she might return blow for blow. All at once the thought made him spiritually sick and the glory and desirableness of life seemed to fade. He could not see through its dark places, dark where all had been sunshine. He had been a boy yesterday, a man only by virtue of his astounding courage and resource, but he was awakening from boyhood, and manhood was hard. His education had begun, and he could not value the education of pain. The soundest, the most costly one there is, any more than any of us do whilst it lasts. He did not think any more than any of us think that perhaps, when we come to lie on our deathbeds, we shall know that of all the privileges of the life behind us, the greatest has been the privilege of having suffered and fought. All he knew was that his heart ached, that he had disappointed and estranged the person he loved best, and had lost, at any rate temporarily, the home that had been so dear. But hope would not desert him in spite of everything. Madame Flemington had gone very wide of the mark in suspecting him of any leanings toward the Stuarts, and she would soon understand how little intention he had of turning rebel. There was still work for him to do. He had been given a free hand in details, and he would go to Brecon for the night. Tomorrow he must decide what to do. Possibly he would ask to be transferred to some other place, but nothing that heaven or earth could offer him should make him betray Logie. Madame Flemington had seen him go, in ignorance of whether he had gone in obedience or in revolt. Perhaps she imagined that her arguments and the hateful story she had laid bare to him had prevailed, and that he was returning to his unfinished portrait. In the excitement of his interview with her, he had not told her anything but that he refused definitely to spy upon James any more. He had started for Ardguy so early, and had been there such a short time, that he was back in Forfar by noon. There he left his horse, and mounting another, set off for Brecon. He was within sight of its ancient round tower, grey among the yellowing trees above the south esk when close to his left hand there arose the shrill screech of a pipe, cutting into his abstraction of mind like a sharp stab of pain. It was so loud and sudden that the horse leaped to the farther side of the road, snorting, and Flemington, sitting loosely, nearly lost his seat. He pulled up the astonished animal 
and peered into a thicket of alder growing by the wayside. The ground was marshy and the stunted trees were set close, but dividing their branches he saw behind their screen an open patch in the midst of which was Skirling Waddy's cart. His jovial face seemed to illuminate the spot. "'Dod!' exclaimed the piper. "'Ye was near doon. I'd no seek to change wi' you. I'm safer with my dogs than you with yon horse. What ailed ye that ye gaed awa for a banillo? "'Private matters,' said Archie shortly. "'Aweel, they private matters was no far from me putting it the toll booth. What guard ye no tell me ye was gyin?' "'Have you got a letter for me?' said Flemington, as Waddy began to draw up his sliding board. "'Aye, there's one. But just wait you, my lad, till I tell ye what I was saying to old Davy.' "'Never mind what you said to Lord Balnillo,' broke in Flemington. "'I want my letter.' He slipped from the saddle and looped the rein over his arm. "'Dinna bring yon brute near me,' cried Waddy, as horse and man began to crush through the alders. "'I'm fell feared o' they unchancy cattle.' Archie made an impatient sound, and threw the rein over a stump. He approached the cart, and the yellow dog, who was for once lying down, opened his wary golden eyes, watching each movement that brought the intruder nearer to his master, without raising his head. "'You are not often on this side of Brecon,' said Archie, as the beggar handed him the packet. "'Fegs, now,' nah, returned Waddy, "'but old Davy and his toll-booths on the ither side—' And it's no safe yonder. It's yourself I hate to thank for that, Mr. Flemington. I dinna ken where ye was, say a gaid up to the muckle who's to spear for ye. The old stock came doon himself. Dod, the dog gared him loop, and the pipes gared him skellick. But he telt me where ye was. Plague take you. Did you go there asking for me? cried Archie. What was I to-day? I tellt Davy ye was needin' me to learn ye a sang. The painter lad was seekin' me, says I, and he tellt me to come in by. Flemington's annoyance deepened. He did not know what the zeal of this insufferable rascal had led him to say or do in his name, and he had the rueful sense that the tangle he had paid such a heavy price to escape from was complicating round him. The officious familiarity of the piper exasperated him and he resented government's choice of such a tool. He put the letter in his pocket and began to back out of the thicket. He would read his instructions by himself. "'Hey, you're no a wa, man!' cried Waddy. "'I have no time to waste,' said Flemington, his foot in the stirrup. "'But you no tell to me where you're going.' "'Brecken!' Archie called the word over his shoulder and started off at a trot which he kept up until he had left the alder bushes some way behind him. Then he broke the seal of his letter, and found that he was to convey the substance of each report that he sent in, not only to His Majesty's intelligence officer at Perth, but to Captain Hall of the English ship Venture that was lying under Ferryden. He was to proceed at once to the vessel, to which further instructions for him would be sent in a couple days' time. He pocketed the letter and drew a breath of relief, blessing the encounter that he had just cursed, for a road of escape from his present difficulty began to open before him. He must take to his own feet on the other side of Brecon and go straight to the venture. He would be close to Montrose in communication with it, though not within the precincts of the town, and safe from the chance of running against Logie. Balnillo and his brother would not know what had become of him, and Christian Flemington would be cured of her suspicions by the simple testimony of his whereabouts. He would treat the two days that he had spent at the judge's house as if they had dropped out of his life, and merely report his late presence in Montrose to the captain of the sloop. He would describe his watching of the two men who came out of the happy land, and how he had followed them to the harbour through the darkness, how he had seen them stop opposite the ship's light as they discussed their plans, how he had tried to secure the paper they held. He would tell the captain that he believed some design against the ship to be on foot, but he would not let Logie's name pass his lips, and he would deny any knowledge of the identity of either man 
lest the mention of Farrier should confirm the suspicions of those who guessed he was working with James. When he had reported himself to Perth from the ship, he would no longer be brought into contact with Skirling Wattie, which at that moment struck him as an advantage. The evenings had begun to close in early. As he crossed the Esk Bridge and walked out of Brecon, the dusk was enwrapping its parapet like a veil. He hurried on and struck out along the road that would lead him to Ferryden by the southern shore of the basin. His way ran up a long ascent, and when he stood at the top of the hill, the outline of the moon's disk was rising, faint behind the thin cloudy bank that rested on the sea beyond Montrose. There was just enough daylight left to show him the basin lying between him and the broken line of the town's twinkling lights under the muffled moon. It was quite dark when he stood at last within hail of the venture. As he went along the bank at the Esk's mouth, he could see before him the cluster of houses that formed Ferryden Village and the North Sea beyond it, a formless void in the night with the tide far out. Though the moon was well up, the cloud bank had risen with her and taken all sharpness out of the atmosphere. At his left hand the water crawled, slithering at the foot of the sloping bank, like a dark, full-fed snake, and not thirty yards out, just where it broadened, stretching to the quays of Montrose, the vessel lay at anchor, a stationary blot on the slow movement. Upstream, between her and the basin, the wedge-shaped island of Inchbrayock split the mass of water into two portions. Flemington halted, taking in the dark scene, which he had contemplated from its reverse side only a few nights ago. Then he went down to the water and put his hands round his mouth. "'Venture ahoy!' he shouted. There was no movement on the ship. He waited and then called again, with the same result. Through an open portal came a man's laugh, sudden as though provoked by some unexpected jest. The water was deep here, and the ship lay so near that every word was carried across it to the shore. The laugh exasperated him. He threw all the power of his lungs into another shout. "'Who goes there?' said a voice. "'Friend,' replied Archie, and fearing to be asked for a countersign, he called quickly, "'Despatches for Captain Hall.' "'Captain Hall is ashore,' announced a second voice, "'and no one boards us till he returns.' The venture was near enough to the bank for Archie to hear some derisive comment, the words of which he could not completely distinguish. A suppressed laugh followed. "'Damn it!' he cried. "'Am I to be kept here all night?' "'Like enough, if you mean to wait for the captain.' This reply came from the open porthole in which the light was obliterated by the head of the man who spoke. There was a sound as of someone pulling him back by the heels, and the port was an eye of light again. Flemington turned and went up the bank, and as he reached the top and sprang on to the path, he ran into a short, stoutish figure which was beginning to descend. An impatient expletive burst from it. "'You needn't hurry, sir,' said Archie, as the other hailed the vessel querulously. "'You are not likely to get on board.' "'What? What? Not board my own ship?' Flemington was a good deal taken aback. He could not see much in the clouded night, but no impression of authority seemed to emanate from the indistinguishable person beside him. Ten thousand pardons, sir!' exclaimed the young man. "'You are Captain Hall? I have information for you, and am sent by His Majesty's intelligence officer in Perth to report myself to you. Flemington is my name.' For a minute the little man said nothing and Archie felt rather than saw his fidgety movements. He seemed to be hesitating. A boat was being put off from the ship. She lay so near to him that a mere push from her side brought the craft almost into the bank. "'It is so dark that I must show you my credentials on board,' said Archie, taking Captain Hall's acquiescence for granted. He heard his companion drawing in his breath nervously through his teeth. No opposition was made as he stepped into the boat. When he stood on deck beside Hall, the ship was quiet, 
and the sounds of laughter were silent. He had the feeling that everyone on board had got out of the way on purpose as he followed the captain down the companion to his cabin. As the latter opened the door, the light within revealed him plainly for the first time. He was a small ginger-haired man, whose furtive eyes were set very close to a thin-bridged aquiline nose. His gait was remarkable, because he trotted rather than walked. His restless fingers rubbed one another as he spoke. He looked peevish and a little dissipated, and his manner conveyed the idea that he felt himself to have no business where he was. As Archie remarked that, he told himself that it was a characteristic he had never yet seen in a seaman. His dress was careless, and a wine-stain on his cravat caught his companion's eye. He had the personality of a rabbit. Hall did not sit down, but stood at the farther side of the table, looking with a kind of grudging intentness at his guest, and Flemington was inclined to laugh in spite of the heavy heart he had carried all day. The other moved about with undecided steps. When at last he sat down, just under the swinging lamp, Archie was certain that although he could be called sober, he had been drinking. "'Your business, sir,' he began in a husky voice. "'I must tell you that I am fatigued. I had hoped to go to bed in peace.' He paused, leaning back, and surveyed Flemington with injured distaste. "'There is no reason that you should not,' replied Archie boldly. "'I've had a devilish hard day myself.' Give me a corner to lie in tonight, and I will give you the details of my report quickly. He saw that he would meet with no opposition from Hall, whose one idea was to spare himself effort, and that his own quarters on board the venture were sure. No doubt long practice had enabled the man to look less muddled than he felt. He sat down opposite to him. The other put out his hand as though to ward him off. "'I have no leisure for business to-night,' he said. "'This is not the time for it. "'All the same, I have orders from Perth to report myself to you, "'as I have told you already,' said Archie. "'If you will listen, I will try to make myself clear "'without troubling you to read anything. "'I have information to give which you should hear at once.' "'I tell you that I cannot attend to you,' said Hall. "'I shall not keep you long. "'You do not realize that it is important, sir. Am I to be dictated to, exclaimed the other, raising his voice? This is my own ship, Mr. Flem, Fling, Fl The name presented so much difficulty to Hall that it died away in a tangled murmur, and Archie saw that to try to make him understand anything important in his present state would be labor lost. Well, sir, said he, I will tell you at once that I suspect an attack on you is brewing in Montrose. I believe that it may happen at any moment. Having delivered myself of that, I had best leave you. The word attack found its way to the captain's brain. It's impossible, he exclaimed crossly. Why, plague on I've got all the town guns. Nonsense, sir, nonsense. Come, I will call for a bottle of wine, and you can go. "'There's an empty bunk, I suppose.' The order was given, and the wine was brought. Archie noticed that the man who set the bottle and the two glasses on the table threw a casual look at Hall's hand, which shook as he helped his guest. He had eaten little since morning, and drunk less. Now that he had attained his object, and found himself in temporary shelter and temporary peace, he realized how glad he was of the wine. When, after a single glassful, he rose to follow the sailor who came to show him his bunk, he turned to bid good night to Hall. The light hanging above the captain's head revealed every line, every contour of his face with merciless candor, and Flemington could see that no lover, counting the minutes till he should be left with his mistress, had ever longed more eagerly to be alone with her and this man longed to be alone with the bottle before him. Archie threw himself thankfully into his bunk. There was evidently room for him on the ship, and there was no trace of another occupant in the little cabin. Nevertheless, it looked untidy and unswept. The port close to which he lay was on the starboard side of the vessel, and looked across the strait towards the town. 
The lamps were nearly all extinguished on the quays, and only here and there a yellow spot of light made a faint ladder in the water. The pleasant trickling sound outside was soothing, with its impersonal, monotonous whisper. He wondered how long Hall would sit bemusing himself at the table, and what the discipline of a ship commanded by this curiously ineffective personality could be. Tomorrow he must make out his story to the little man. He could not reproach himself with having postponed his report, for he knew that Hall's brain, which might possibly be clearer in the morning, was incapable of taking in any but the simplest impressions to-night. Tired as he was, he did not sleep for a long time. The scenes of the past few days ran through his head one after another. Now they appeared unreal, now almost visible to his eyes. Sometimes the space of time they covered seemed age-long, sometimes a passing flash. This was Saturday night, and all the events that had accumulated in the disjointing of his life had been crowded into it since Monday. On Monday he had not suspected what lay in himself. He would have jibed that he'd been told that another man's personality, a page out of another man's history, could play such havoc with his own interests. He wondered what James was doing. Was he, now, over there in the darkness, looking across the rolling, sea-bound water straight to the spot on which he lay? Would he? Could space be obliterated and night illuminated, look up to find his steady eyes upon him? He lay quiet, marveling, speculating. Then Logie, the shadowy town, the burning autumn trees of Balnillo, the tulips round the house in faraway Holland, fell away from his mind, and in their place was the familiar background of Ardguys. The Ardguys of his childhood, with the silver-haired figure of Madame Flemington confronting him, that terrible, unsparing presence, wrapped about with something greater and more arresting than mere beauty, the quality that had wrought on him since he was a little lad. He turned about with a convulsive breath that was almost a sob. Then, at last, he slept soundly, to be awakened just at dawn by the roar of a gun, followed by a rattle of small shot and the frantic hurrying of feet overhead. End of chapter 10 How he had seen them stop opposite the ship's light as they discussed their plans. How he had seen them stop opposite the ship's light as they discussed their plans. Chapter 11 of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 11. The Guns of Montrose. When Archie lay and pictured James on the other side of the water, his vision was a true one. But when he saw him on the quay among the sheds and windlasses, he had set him in the wrong place. James stood at the point of the bay formed by the basin of Montrose at the inner and landward side of the town, not far from the empty fort from which Hall had taken the guns. The sands at his feet were bare, for the tide was out, and the salt, wet smell of the oozing weed blew round him on the faint wind. He was waiting for Ferrier. They had chosen this night, as at this hour the ebbing tide would make it possible for the hundred men of Ferrier's regiment to keep clear of the roads, and to make their way from Brecon on the secluded shore of the basin. Logie had not been there long when he heard the soft sound of coming feet, and the occasional knocking of shoes against stone. As an increasing shadow took shape, he struck his hand twice against his thigh, and the shadow grew still. He struck again, and in another minute Ferrier was beside him. The soldiers who followed halted behind their leader. The two men said little to each other, but moved on side by side, and the small company wound up the rising slope of the shore to the deserted fort and gathered at its foot. James and his friend went on a little way and stood looking east down the townward shore 
of the strait, past the huddled houses massed together at this end of Montrose. The water slid to the sea, and halfway down the long quay in front of them was moored the unrigged bark that held the town guns. The four-pounders and six-pounders that had pointed their muzzles for so many years from the fort walls towards the thundering bar. Paul had not concerned himself to bring the vessel into his own immediate neighborhood, nor even to put a few dozen yards of water between her and the shore. He knew that no organized rebel force existed within nine miles of where she lay, and that the Jacobites among the townsmen could not attempt any hostile movement unaided. He had eighty men on board the venture with him, and from them he had taken a small guard which was left in charge of the bark. Every two or three days he would send a party from the sloop to patrol the streets of Montrose, and to impress disloyally inclined people. His own investigations of the place had not been great, for, though he went ashore a good deal, it cannot be said that King George's interests were much furthered by his doings when he got there. When Logie and Ferrier had posted a handful of men in the empty fort, they went on towards the bark's moorings, followed by the rest, and leaving a few to guard the mouth of each street that opened on the quay. The whole world was a bed behind the darkened windows and the grim stone walls that brooded like blind faces over the stealthy band passing below. When they reached the spot where the ferry-boat lay that plied between Montrose and the south shore of the strait, two men went down to the landing stage, and, detaching her chains, got her ready to push off. Then, with no more delay, the friends pressed on to the main business of their expedition. As they neared the bark, a faint shine forward where her bows pointed seaward suggested that someone on board was waking. So, judging it best to make the attack before an alarm could be given, the two captains ran on with their men and were climbing over the bulwarks and tumbling onto her deck before Captain Hall's guard, who were playing cards round a lantern, had time to collect their senses. The three players sprang to their feet, and one of them sent a loud cry ringing into the darkness before he sprawled senseless with his head laid open by the butt-end of Ferrier's pistol. In this unlooked-for onslaught that had come upon them as suddenly as the swoop of a squall in a treacherous sea, they struck blindly about, stumbling into the arms of the swarming, unrecognized figures that had poured in on their security out of the peaceful night. James had kicked over the lantern, and the cards lay scattered about underfoot, white spots in the dimness. The bank of cloud was thinning a little round the moon, and the angles of the objects on deck began to be more clearly blocked out. One of the three, who had contrived to wrench himself from his assailant's hold, sprang away and raced towards the after part of the ship, where, with the carelessness of security, he had left his musket. Three successive shots was the signal for help from the venture in case of emergency, and he made a gallant effort to get free to send this sign of distress across the strait. But he was headed back and overpowered before he could carry out his intention. One of his companions was lying as if dead on the deck, and the other, who had been cajoled to silence by the suggestive caress of a pistol at the back of his ear, was having his arms bound behind him with his own belt. Not a shot had been fired except for that one cry from the man who lay so still at their feet, no sound but the scuffling and cursing on the bark disturbed the quiet. Ferrier's men hustled their prisoners below into the cabin, where they were gagged and secured and left under the charge of a couple of soldiers. No roving citizen troubled the neighborhood at this hour, for the fly-by-nights of Montrose looked farther inland for their entertainment, and the fisher-folk, who were the principal dwellers in the poor houses skirting the quays, slept sound and recked little of who might be quarreling out of doors, so long as they lay warm within them. The bark was some way upstream from the general throng of shipping, apart, and, as Hall had thought, the more safe for that, for his calculations had taken no count of an enemy who might come from anywhere but the town. 
He had never dreamed of the silent band which had been yielded up by the misty stretches of the basin. James leaned over the vessel's side towards the venture and thought of Captain Hall. He had seen him in a tavern of the town and had been as little impressed by his looks as was Flemington. He had noticed the uncertain eye, the restless fingers, the trotting gait, and had held him lightly as a force, for he knew as well as most men know who have knocked about this world that character, none other, is the hammer that drives home every nail into the framework of achievement. But he had no time to spend in speculations, for his interest was centred in the ferry-boat that was now slipping noiselessly towards them on the current, guided downstream by the couple of soldiers who had unmoored her. As she reached the bark, a rope was tossed down to her, and she was made fast. The stolen guns were hauled from their storage, and a six-pounder lowered with its ammunition into the great tub that scarcely heaved on the slow swirl of the river. And whilst the work was going on, Ferrier and James stepped ashore to the quay and walked each a short way along it, watching for any movement or for the chance of surprise. There was nothing, only from far out beyond the shipping a soft rush, so low that it seemed to be part of the atmosphere itself, told that the tide was on the turn. In the enshrouding night the boat was loaded, and a dozen or so of the little company pushed off with their spoil. Ferrier went with them, and Logie, who was to follow with the second gun, watched the craft making her way into obscurity, like some slow black river monster pushing blindly out into space. The scheme he had been putting together since the arrival of the venture was taking reality at last, and though he could stand with folded arms on the bulwark looking calmly at the departing boat, the fire in his heart burned hot. Custom had inured him to risks of every kind, and if his keenness of enterprise was the same as it had been in youth, the excitement of youth had evaporated. It was the depths that stirred in Logie, seldom the surface. Like Archie Flemington, he loved life, but he loved it differently. Flemington loved it consciously, joyously, pictorially. James loved it desperately, so desperately that his spirit had survived the shock which had robbed it of its glory for him. He was like a faithful lover whose mistress has been scarred by smallpox. He could throw himself heart and soul into the Stuart cause, its details and necessities, all that his support of it entailed upon him, because it had, so to speak, given him his second wind in the race of life. Though he was an adventurer by nature, he differed from the average adventurer in that he sought nothing for himself. He did not conform to the average adventuring type. He was too overwhelmingly masculine to be a dangler about women, though since the shipwreck of his youth he had more than once followed in the train of some complacent goddess and had reaped all the benefits of her notice. He was no snatcher at casual advantages, but a man to whom service in any interest meant solid effort and unsparing sacrifice. Also, he was one who seldom looked back. He had done so once lately, and the act had shaken him to the heart. Perhaps he would do so oftener when he had wrought out the permanent need of action that lay at the foundation of his nature. When the boat had come back, silent on the outflowing river, and had taken her second load, he lowered himself into the stern as her head was pulled round again toward Inchbrayock. The scheme fashioned by the two men for the capture of the vessel depended for its success on their possession of this island. As soon as they should land on it, they were to entrench the two guns, one on its southeastern side as near to the venture as possible, and the other on its northern shore facing the quays. By this means, the small party would command not only the ship, but the whole breadth of the river and its landing places, and would be able to stop communication between Captain Hall and the town. Heavy undergrowth covered a fair portion of Inchbrayock, and the only buildings upon it, if buildings they could be called, were the walls of an old graveyard and the stones and crosses they encircled. Though the island lay at a convenient part of the strait, 
no bridge connected it with Montrose, and those who wished to cross the Esk at that point were obliged to use the ferry. The channel dividing its southern shore from the mainland being comparatively narrow, a row of gigantic stepping stones carried wayfarers dry shod across its bed, for at low tide there was a mere streak of water curling serpent-wise through the mud. When the guns were got safely into position on the island, it was decided that Ferrier was to return to the bark and take the remaining four-pounders, with all despatch, to a piece of rising ground called Dial Hill that overlooked the mass of shipping opposite Ferryden. He did not expect to meet with much opposition, should news of his action be carried to the town, for its main sympathies were with his side, and the force on the government vessel would be prevented from coming over the strait to oppose him, until he was settled on his eminence by the powerful dissuaders he had left behind him on Inch Brayock. He was to begin firing from Dial Hill at dawn, and James, who was near enough to the venture to see any movement that might take place on her, was to be ready with his fire and with his small party of marksmen to check any offensive force despatched from the ship to the quays. Hall would thus be cut off from the town by the fire from Inch Brayock, on the one hand, and should he attempt a landing nearer to the water mouth by the guns on Dial Hill on the other. James had placed himself advantageously. The thicket of elder and thorn which had engulfed one end of the burial ground made excellent concealment, and in front of him was the solid wall, through a gap in which he had turned the muzzle of his six-pounder. He sat on the stump of a thorn-tree, his head in his hands, waiting as he knew he would have to wait for some time yet, till the first round from Dial Hill should be the signal for his own attack. The moon had made her journey by this hour, and while she had been caught in her course through the zenith in the web of cloud and mist that thickened the sky, she was now descending towards her rest through a clear stretch. She swung as though suspended above the basin, tilted on her back, and a little yellower as she neared the earth, a dying witch-like thing halfway through her second quarter. James, looking up, could see her between the arms of the crosses and the leaning stones. The strangeness of the place arrested his thoughts and turned them into unusual tracks, for, though far from being an unimaginative man, he was little given to deliberate contemplation. The distant inland water under the lighted half-disc was pale, and a faintness seemed to lie upon the earth in this hour between night and morning. His thoughts went to the only dwellers on Inch Brayock, those who were lying under his feet, seamen for the most part, and fisher folk, who had known the fury of the North Sea that was now beginning to crawl in and to surround them in their little township with its insidious arms, encircling in death the bodies that had escaped it in life. Some of them had been far afield, farther than he had ever been in spite of all his campaigns but they had come in over the bar to lie here in the jaws of the outflowing river by their native town. He wondered whether he should do the same. Times were so uncertain now that he might well take the road into the world again. The question of where his bones should lie was a matter of no great interest to him, and though there was a vague restfulness in the notion of coming at last to the slopes and shadows of Balnillo, He knew that the wideness of the world was his natural home. Then he thought of Bergen op Zoom. After a while he raised his head again, roused, not by the streak of light that was growing upon the east, but by a shot that shattered the silence and sent the echoes rolling out from Dial Hill. End of chapter 11《ャプター・ e l v e of Flemington》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 12. Inch Brayock. Archie sprang up, unable for a moment to remember where he was. 
He was almost in darkness, for the port looked northward and the pale light barely glimmered through it, but he could just see a spurt of white leap into the air midway across the channel, where a second shot had struck the water. As he rushed on deck, a puff of smoke was dispersing above Dial Hill. Then another cloud rolled from the bushes on the nearest point of Inchbrayock Island, and he felt the venture shiver and move in her moorings. Captain Hall's voice was rising above the scuffling and running that was going on all over the ship, and the dragging about of heavy objects was making the deck shake. He went below and began to hustle on his clothes, for the morning air struck chill, and he felt the need of being ready for action of some kind. In a few minutes he came up warily and crept round to the port side, taking what cover he could. Then a roar burst from the side of the venture as she opened fire. He stood, not knowing what to do with himself. It was dreadful to him to have to be inactive whilst his blood rose with the excitement round him. No one on the vessel remembered his existence. He was like a stray dog in a marketplace, thrust aside by every passer brushing by on the business of life. It was soon evident that although the guns on the hill commanded the venture, their shot was falling short of her. As the sun heaved up from beyond the bar, the quays over the water could be seen filling with people, and the town bells began to ring. An increasing crowd swarmed upon the landing stage of the ferry, but the boat herself had been brought by James to the shore of Inchbrayock, and nobody was likely to cross the water whilst the island and the high ground seaward of the town was held by the invisible enemy which had come upon them from heaven knew where. Captain Hall was turning his attention exclusively on Inchbrayock, and Flemington, who had got nearer to the place where he stood, gathered from what he could hear that the man on Dial Hill was wasting his ammunition on a target that was out of range. A shot from the vessel had torn up a shower of earth in the bank that sloped from the thicket to the river mud, and another had struck one of the gravestones on the island, splitting it in two. But the fire went on steadily from the dense tangle where the churchyard wall no doubt concealed earthworks that had risen behind it in the dark hours. This, then, was the outcome of James's night wanderings with Ferrier. Archie contemplated Captain Hall where he stood in a little group of men. He looked even less of a personage in the morning light than he had done in the cabin, and the young man suspected that he had gone to bed in his clothes. This reminded him that he himself was unwashed, unshaven, and very hungry. Whatsoever the issue of the attack might be, there was no use in remaining starved and dirty, and he determined to go below to forage and to find some means of washing. There was no one to gainsay him at this time of stress, and he walked into Hall's cabin reflecting that he might safely steal anything he could carry from the ship, if he was so minded, and slip overboard across the narrow arm to the bank, with nothing worse than a wetting. Whilst he was attending to his own necessities, the booming went on overhead, and at last a shout from above sent him racing up from the welcome food he had contrived to secure. The wall on Inchbrayock was shattered in two or three places, and the unseen gun was silent. The cannonade from Dial Hill had stopped, but a train of figures was hurrying across from the northern shore of the island, taking shelter among the bushes and stones. A boat was being lowered from the venture, for the tide, now sweeping in, had covered the mud, making a landing possible. Men were crowding into her, and as Flemington got round to his former place of observation, she was being pushed off. Hall, who was standing alone, caught sight of him and came towards him. His face looked swollen and puffy, and his eyes were bloodshot. "'We have been attacked,' he began. "'Attacked most unexpectedly.' "'I had the honour to report that possibility to you last night, sir,' replied Flemington, with a trifle of insolence in his manner. An angry look shot out of Hall's rabbit eyes. "'What could you possibly have known about such a thing?' he cried. "'What reason had you for making such a statement?' "'I had a great many,' said Archie. "'But you informed me that you had no leisure to listen to any of them until this morning. 
Perhaps you are at leisure now? You are a damned impudent scoundrel, cried the other, noticing Flemington's expression, which amply justified these words. But you had better take care. There's nothing to prevent me from putting you under arrest. Nothing but the orders I carry in my pocket, replied Archie. They are likely enough to deter you. The other opened his mouth to speak, but before he could do so, a shot crashed into the fore part of the ship, and a hail of bullets ripped out from the thicket on the island. The boat, which was halfway between the venture and Inch Brayuk, spun round, and two of the rowers fell forward over their oars. Hall left Archie standing where he was. The gun that the ship's gunners believed themselves to have disabled had opened fire again. After a silence that had been, perhaps, but a lure to draw a sortie from her, and as it was mere destruction for the boat to attempt a landing in the face of the shot, she had orders to put back. The position in which he was placed was now becoming clear to Hall. He was cut off from communication with the quays by the guns safely entrenched on the island, and those on Dial Hill, though out of range for the moment, would prevent him from moving nearer to the water mouth or making an attempt to get out to sea. He could not tell what was happening in the town opposite, and he had no means of finding out, for the whole of the cannon that he had been mad enough to leave by the shore was in the enemy's possession, and would remain so unless the townspeople should rise in the government interest for their recapture. This he was well aware they would not do. His resentment against his luck and the tale-bearing voice within, which told him that he had nothing to thank for it but his own carelessness, grew more insistent as his head grew clearer. He had been jerked out of sleep, heavy-headed, and with a brain still dulled by drink, but the morning freshness worked on him, and the sun warmed his senses into activity. The sight of Flemington, clean, impertinent, and entirely comprehensive of the circumstances, drove him mad, and it drove him still madder to know that Archie understood why he had been unwilling to see his report last night. Hall's abilities were a little superior to his looks. So far he had served his country, not conspicuously, but without disaster, and had he been able to keep himself as sober as most people contrived to be in those intemperate days, he might have gone on his course with the same tepid success. He was one who liked the distractions of towns, and he bemoaned the fate that had sent him to anchor in a dull creek of the east coast, where the taverns held nothing but faces, whose unconcealed dislike forbade conviviality, and where even the light women looked upon his uniform askance. He was not a lively comrade at the best of times, and here, where he was thrown upon the sole society of his officers, with whom he was not popular, he was growing more morose and more careless as his habits of stealthy excess grew upon him. Archie, with his quick judgment of his fellow men, had measured him accurately, and he knew it. In the midst of the morning's disaster, the presence of the interloper, his flippant civility of word and insolence of manner, made his sluggish blood boil. It was plain that the party on the island must be dislodged before anything could be done to save the situation, and Hall now decided to land as large a force as he could spare upon the mainland. By marching it along the road to Ferryden, he would give the impression that some attempt was to be made to cross the strait nearer to the coast, and to land it between Dial Hill and the sea. Behind Ferryden village, a rough track turned sharply southward up the bank, and this they were to take. They would be completely hidden from Inch Brayuk once they had got over the crest of the land, and they were to double back with all speed along the mainland under shelter of the ridge, and to go for about a mile parallel with the basin. When they had got well to the westward side of the island, they were to wheel down to the basin shore at a spot where a grove of trees edged the brink, for here, in a sheltering turn of backwater among the trunks and roots, a few boats were moored for the convenience of those who wished to cross straight to Montrose by water, instead of taking the usual path by the stepping-stones 
over Inchbrayock Island. They were to embark at this place, and hugging the shore under cover of its irregularities, to approach Inchbrayock from the west. If they should succeed in landing unseen, they would surprise the enemy at the further side of the graveyard, whilst his attention was turned on the venture. The officer to be sent in command of the party believed it could be done, because the length of the island would intervene to hide their manoeuvres from the town, where the citizens, crowding on the quays, would be only too ready to direct the notice of the rebels to their approach. As the boat put off from the ship, Archie slipped into it. He seemed to have lost his definite place in the scheme of things during the last twenty-four hours. He was nobody's servant, nobody's master, nobody's concern, and in spite of his bold reply to Hall's threat of arrest, he knew quite well that though the captain would stop short of such a measure, he might order him below at any moment. The only wonder was that he had not done so already. He did not know into what hands he might fall, should Hall be obliged to surrender, and this contingency appeared to be growing likely. By tacking himself on to the landing party, he would at least have the chance of action, and though, having been careful to keep out of Hall's sight, he had not been able to discover their destination, he had determined to land with the men. After they had disembarked, he went boldly up to the officer in charge of the party and asked for permission to go with it, and when this was accorded with some surprise, he fell into step. As they tramped along towards Ferryden, he managed to pick up something of the work in hand from the man next to him. His only fear was of the chance of running against Logie. Nevertheless, he made up his mind to trust to luck to save him from that, because he believed that Logie, as a professional soldier, would be in command of the guns on the hill. It was from Dial Hill that the tactical details of the attack could best be directed, and if either of the conspirators were upon the island, Archie was convinced it would be Ferrier. They soon reached Ferryden. The sun was clear and brave in the salt air over the sea, and a flock of gulls was screaming out beyond the bar, dipping, hovering, swinging sideways against the light breeze, now this way, now that way, their wanton voices full of mockery, as though the derisive spirits imprisoned in the ocean had become articulate and were crying out on the land. The village looked distrustfully at the approach of the small company, and some of the fisherwives dragged their children indoors, as if they were thought to see them kidnapped. Such men as were hanging about watched them with sullen eyes as they turned in between the houses and made for the higher ground. The boom of the venture's guns came to them from time to time, and once they heard a great shout rise from the quays, but they could see nothing because of the intervening swell of the land. They passed a farm and a few scattered cottages, but these were empty, for their inmates had gone to the likeliest places they could find for a view of what was happening in the harbour. Presently they went down to the basin, straggling by twos and threes. At the water's edge a colony of beeches stood naked and leafless, their heads listed over westward by the winds that swept up the river's mouth. They were crowded thick about the creek down which Flemington and his companions came, and at their feet, tied to the gnarled elbows of the great roots beneath which the water had eaten deep into the bank, lay three or four boats with their oars piled inside them. The beech mast of years had sunk into the soil, giving a curious mixture of heaviness and elasticity to the earth as it was trodden. A water rat drew a lead-colored ripple along the transparency, below which the undulations of the bottom lay like a bird's-eye view of some miniature world. The quiet of this hidden landing-place echoed to the clank of the rowlocks, as the heavy oars were shipped and two boatloads slid out between the stems. Archie, who was unarmed, had borrowed one of the officer's pistols, not so much with the intention of using it as from the wish for a plausible pretext for joining the party. At any time his love of adventure would welcome such an opportunity, and at this moment he did not care what might happen to him. 
He seemed to have no chance of being true to anybody, and it was being revealed to him that, in these circumstances, life was scarcely endurable. He had never thought about it before, and he could think of nothing else now. It was some small comfort to know that, should his last half-hour of life be spent on Inchbrayock, Madame Flemington would at least understand that she had wronged him in suspecting him of being a turncoat. If only James could know that he had not betrayed him, or rather that his report was in the hands of that accursed beggar before they met among the broom bushes. Yet what if he did know it? Would his loathing of the spy under the roof tree of his brother's house be any the less? He would never understand, never know. And yet he had been true to him in his heart, and the fact that he had now no roof tree of his own proved it. They slipped in under the bank of the island and disembarked silently. The higher ground in the middle of it crossed their front like the line of an incoming wave, hiding all that was going on on its farther side. They were to advance straight over it and to rush down upon the thicket where the gun was entrenched with its muzzle towards the venture. There was to be no working round the north shore, lest the hundreds of eyes on the quay should catch sight of them and a hundred tongues give the alarm to the rebels. They were to attack at once, only waiting for the sound of another shot to locate the exact place for which they were to make. They stood drawn up, waiting for the order. Archie dropped behind the others. His heart had begun to sink. He had assured himself over and over again that Logie must be on Dial Hill. Yet, as each moment brought him nearer to contact with the enemy, he felt cold misgiving stealing on him. What if his guesses had been wrong? He knew that he had been a fool to run the risk he had taken. Chance is such a smiling, happy-go-lucky deity when we see her afar off, but when we are well on our steady plod towards her and the distance lessens between us, it is often all that we can do to meet her eyes. Their expression has changed." Archie's willingness to take risks was unfailing and temperamental, and he had taken this one in the usual spirit. But so much had happened lately to shake his confidence in life and in himself that his high heart was beating slower. Never had he dreaded anything as much as he dreaded James's knowledge of the truth. Yet the most agonizing part of it all was that James could not know the whole truth, nor understand it, even if he knew it. Archie's reading of the other man's character was accurate enough to tell him that no knowledge of facts could make Logie understand the part he had played. Sick at heart, he stood back from the party, watching it gather before the officer. He did not belong to it. No one troubled his head about him, and the men's backs were towards him. He stole away, sheltered by a little hillock, and ran, bent almost double, to the southern shore of the island. He would creep round it and get as near as possible to the thicket. If he could conceal himself, he might be able to see the enemy and the enemy's commander, and to discover the truth while there was yet time for flight. He glanced over his shoulder to see if the officer had noticed his absence, and being reassured, he pressed on. He knew that anyone who thought about him at all would take him for a coward, but he did not reckon that. The dread of meeting James possessed him. Sheep were often brought over to graze the island, and their tracks ran like network among the bushes. He trod softly in and out, anxious to get forward before the next sound of the gun should let loose the invading party upon the rebels. He passed the end of the stepping stones, which crossed the Esk's bed to the mainland. They were now nearly submerged by the tide rising in the river. He had not known of their existence, and as he noticed them with surprise, a shot shook the air, and though the thicket, now not far before him, blocked his view of the venture's hull, he saw the tops of her masts tremble, and knew that she had been struck. Before him the track took a sharp turn round a bend of the shore, which cut the path like a little promontory, so that he could see nothing beyond it, 
and here he paused. In another few minutes the island would be in confusion from the attack, and he might discover nothing. He set his teeth and stepped round the corner. The track widened out and then plunged into the fringe of the thicket. A man was kneeling on one knee with his back to Flemington. His hands were shading his eyes, and he was peering along a tunnel-shaped gap in the branches, through which could be seen a patch of river and the damaged boughs of the venture. Archie's instinct was to retreat, but before he could do so, the man jumped up and faced him. His heart leaped to his mouth, for it was James. Logie stood staring at him. Then he made a great effort to pick up the connecting link of recollection that he felt sure he must have dropped. He had been so much absorbed in the business at hand that he found it impossible for a moment to estimate the significance of any outside matter. Though he was confounded and disturbed by the unlooked-for apparition of the painter, the idea of hostility never entered his mind. Flemington, he exclaimed, stepping towards him. But the other man's expression was so strange that he stopped, conscious of vague disaster. What had the intruder come to tell him? As he stood, Flemington murmured something he could not distinguish, then turned quickly in his tracks. Logie leaped after him and seized him by the shoulder before he had time to double round the bend. "'Let me go!' cried Archie, his chest heaving. "'Let me go, man!' But James's grip tightened. He was a strong man, and he almost dragged him over. As he held him, he caught sight of the government pistol in his belt. It was one that the officer who had lent it to Flemington had taken from the ship. He jerked Archie violently round and made a snatch at the weapon, and the younger man, all but thrown off his balance, thrust his arm convulsively into the air. His sleeve shot back, laying bare a round red spot outside the brown sinewy wrist. Then there flashed retrospectively before James's eyes that same wound, bright in the blaze of the flaming paper, and with it there flashed comprehension. His impulse was to draw his own pistol and to shoot the spy dead, but Archie recovered his balance and was grappling with him, so that he could not get his arm free. The strength of the slim, light young man astonished him. He was as agile as a weasel, but James found in him, added to his activity, a force that nearly matched his own. There was no possible doubt of Logie's complete enlightenment, though he kept his crooked mouth shut and uttered no word. His eyes wore an expression not solely due to the violent struggle going on. They were terrible, and they woke the frantic instinct of self-preservation in Flemington. He knew that James was straining to get out his own pistol, and he hung on him and gripped him for dear life. As they swayed and swung to and fro, trampling the bents, there rose from behind the graveyard a yell that gathered and broke over the sound of their own quick breaths, like a submerging flood, and the bullets began to whistle over the rising ground. Archie saw a change come into James's eyes. Then he found himself staggering, hurled with swift and tremendous force from his antagonist. He was flung headlong against the jutting bend round which he had come, and his forehead struck it heavily. Then, rolling down to the track at its foot, he lay stunned and still. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter Thirteen. The Interested Spectator. As James Logie dashed back to his men to meet this unexpected attack, he left Flemington lying with his face to the bank and his back towards the river. He was so close to the edge of the island that his hair rested on the wet sand, permeated by the returning tide coming up the esk. 
James's whole mind had gone back like a release spring to its natural preoccupation, and he almost forgot him before he had time to join the brisk affray that was going on. But though Archie lay where he fell and was as still as a heap of driftwood, it was only a few minutes before he came to himself. Perhaps the chill of the damp sand under his head helped to revive him. Perhaps the violence of the blow had been broken by the sod against which he had been hurled. He stirred and raised himself, dazed, but listening to the confused sounds of fighting that rang over Inch Brayock. His head hurt him, and instinctively he grubbed up a handful of the cold, wet sand and held it to his brow. His wits had not gone far, for there had been no long break in his consciousness, and he got on his feet and looked round for the best means of escape. James knew all, that was plain enough, and on the issue of the skirmish his own liberty would depend, if he did not get clear of the island at once. He went back round the bend, and looking up the shore he saw a couple of the stepping-stones, which were only half covered by the tide. In the middle of the channel they had disappeared already, but at either edge they lay visible like the two ends of a partly submerged chain. Blood was trickling down his face, but he washed it off and made hastily for the crossing, wading in. The esk was not wide just there, though it was far deeper than he had fancied it, and he stumbled along, churning up the mud into an opaque swirl through which he could not see the bottom. He climbed the further bank, wasting no time in looking behind him, and never stopped until he stood, panting and dizzy, on the high ridge of land from which he could overlook Inchbrayock and the harbour and town. He was a good deal exhausted, for his head throbbed like a boiling pot, and his hands were shaking. He lay down in a patch of winds, remembering that he was on the skyline. He meant to see which way the fortunes of war were going to turn, before deciding what to do with himself. Thanks to chance, his business with Captain Hall was not finished, nor even begun, but as things seemed at present, Captain Hall might be a prisoner before the leisure which had been the subject of his own jibes that morning should arrive. The vessel's guns had roared out again as he struggled up the steep, but there had been silence on the island, and even the rattle of musketry had now stopped. Something decisive must have taken place, though he could not guess what it was, and he was too far away to distinguish more than the moving figures in the graveyard. He was high enough to see the curve of the watery horizon, for Ferryden village was some way below him. His view was only interrupted by a group of firs that stood like an outpost between him and the land's end. He lay among his friendly wind bushes, staring down on the strait. If James were victorious, he knew that there would soon be a hue and cry on his own tracks. But though alive to the desirableness of a good start in these circumstances, he felt that he could not run while there remained any chance of laying the whole of his report before Captain Hall. He thought, from what he had seen of the man, that the less he was reckoned with by his superiors, the better. But it was not his business to consider that. As he turned these things over in his mind, his eyes were attracted to Dial Hill, upon which the sudden sign of a new turn of events could be read. He could see the group of men with the guns below the flagstaff which crowned its summit and what now attracted his attention was a dark object that had been run up the ropes, its irregular outline flapping and flying against the sky as it was drawn frantically up and down. Flemington was blessed with long sight, and he was certain that the two sharp-cut ends that waved like streamers as the dark object dipped and rose were the sleeves of a man's coat. He saw a figure detach itself from the rest and run towards the seaward edge of the eminence. Farrier, for he supposed now that Farrier was on the hill, must be signalling out to sea with his makeshift flag. He half raised himself from his lair. The cold grey-green of the ocean spread along the world's edge, broken by tiny streaks of foam as the wind began to freshen. 
and beyond the fir trees seen through their stems the reason of the activity on dial hill slid into sight a ship was coming up the coast not a couple of miles out and as flemington watched her she stood in landward as though attracted out of her course by the signals and the sound of firing in montrose harbour she was too far off for him to distinguish her colours but he knew enough about shipping to be certain that she was a french frigate he dropped back into his place whilst these sensational matters were going forward he did not suppose that any one would think of pursuing him the fact that the rebels were signalling her in suggested that the stranger might not be unexpected and in all probability she carried french supplies and jacobite troops the likelihood of an interview with captain hall grew more remote the frigate drew closer soon she was hidden from him by the jutting out of the land another shot broke from the venture but the quick reply from the island took all doubt of the issue of the conflict from archie's mind james was in full possession of the place and the surprise must have been a failure archie watched eagerly to see the ship arrive in the river mouth it was evident that hall from his position under the south shore of the strait had not seen her yet presently she rounded the land and appeared to the hundreds of eyes on the quays a gallant silent winged creature a vivid apparition against the band of sea beyond the opening channel of the ask swept towards the town as though by some unseen impulse of fate the shout that went up as she came into view rose to where archie lay on the hillside the tide was now running high and she passed in under dial hill her deck was covered with troops and the waving of hats and the cheers of the townspeople who were pouring along the further side of the harbour made the truth plain to the solitary watcher among the winds the venture sent a shot to meet her that fell just in front of her bows but although it was followed by a second that cut her rigging no great harm was done and she answered with a broadside that echoed off the walls of the town till the strait was in a roar and had no time to subside before james's gun on inch Brayock began again flemington could see that hall's surrender could only be a matter of time the newcomer would soon be landing her troops out of his range and having done so would be certain to attack the venture from the ferryden side of the river half of hall's men were on the island which was in possession of the rebels his vessel was damaged and in no condition to escape to sea, even had there been no hostile craft in his way and no dial hill to stand threatening between him and the ocean. The time had come for Archie to think of his own plight and of his own prospects. He was adrift again, cut off even from the disorderly ship that had sheltered him last night and from the unlucky sot who commanded her. His best plan would be to take the news of Hall's capture to Edinburgh, for it would be madness for him to think of going to Perth whilst his identity as a government agent would be published by Ferrier and Logie all over that part of the country. He was cast down as he sat with his hand to his aching head, and now that it had resulted in that fatal meeting, his own folly in going to the island seemed incredible. His luck had been so good all his life and after the many years that he had trusted her, the jade had turned on him. He'd been too high-handed with her, that was the explanation of it. He had asked too much. He had been overconfident in her, overconfident in himself. Flemington was neither vain nor conceited, being too heartily interested in outside things to take very personal points of view. He merely went straight on with the joy of life lighting his progress but now he had put the crown on his foolhardiness. He had had so many good things, strength, health, wits, charm, the stage of his stirring life whereon to use them, and behind that stage the peaceful background of the home he loved, filled with the presence of the being he most admired and revered on earth. But new lights had broken in on him of late, troublous lights, playing from behind a curtain that hid unknown things. Suddenly he had turned and followed them. 
impelled by uncomprehended forces in himself, and it seemed that in consequence all around him had shifted, disintegrated, leaving him stranded. Once more as he watched, his anxious eyes on the scene below him, his heart full of his own perplexities, a last roar of shot filled the harbour, and then, on the venture, he saw the flag hauled down. He rose and looked about him, telling himself that he must get as far from the neighbourhood of Montrose as he could in the shortest possible time. Sixty miles of land stretched between him and Edinburgh, and the only thing for him to do was to start by way of the nearest seaport from which he could sail for Leith. He was a very different figure from the well-appointed young man who had ridden away from Ardguys only yesterday for he was soaked to above the knees from wading in the ask. Blood had dripped on his coat from the cut on his forehead, and his hair at the back was clogged with sand. Excitement had kept him from thinking how cold he was, and he had not known that he was shivering. But he knew it as he stood in the teeth of the fresh wind. He laughed in spite of his plight. It was so odd to think of starting for Edinburgh from a wind-bush. He turned southwards, determining to go forward till he should strike the road leading to the seaport of Aberbrothock. By sticking to the high ground he would soon come to it at the inland end of the basin, and by it he might reach Aberbrothock by nightfall, and thence take sail in the morning. This was the best plan he could devise, though he did not care to contemplate the miles he would have to trudge. He knew that the broken coast took a great inward curve, and that by this means he would be avoiding its ins and outs, and he wished that he did not feel so giddy and so little able to face his difficulties. He remembered that the money he had on him made a respectable sum, and realized that the less worth robbing he looked, the more likely he would be to get to his journey's end in safety. He stepped out with an effort. Southward he must go and for some time to come, Angus must know him no more. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of Flemington。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 14 In Search of Sensation. When Skirling Watty had delivered his letter to Flemington on the foregoing day, he watched the young man out of sight with disgust and cursed him for a high handed jackanapes. He was not used to be treated in such a fashion. There was that about Archie which took his fancy. For the suggestion of stir and movement that went everywhere with Flemington pleased him, and roused his unfailing curiosity. The beggar's most pleasant characteristic was his interest in everybody and everything, his worst the unseasonable brutality with which he gratified it. A livelihood gained by his own powers of cajolery and persistence had left him without a spark of respect for his kind. He would have been a man of prowess had his limbs been intact, and destiny, in robbing his body of activity, had transferred that quality to his brains, his huge shoulders and broad fists, the arrogant male glare of his roving eye, might well hint at the wisdom of providence in keeping his fear of action to the narrow limits of a go-cart. Those who look for likenesses between people and animals would be reminded by him of a wild boar. It was almost shocking to anyone with a sense of fitness to hear the mellow and touching voice, rich with the indescribable quiver of pathos and tragedy that proceeded from his bristly jaws when he sang. The world that had conjured up before imaginative listeners was a world of twilight, of stars that drew a trail of tear-dimmed luster about the ancient haunted places of the country stars that had shone on battlefields and on the partings of lovers, that had looked on the raids of the border and had stood over the dark border towers among the peat. It was a strange truth that in the voice of this coarse and humble vagabond 
lay the whole distinctive spirit of the national poetry of Scotland. In the last few months his employment had added new zest to his life, for it was not only the pay he received for his occasional carrying of letters that was welcome to him. His bold and guileful soul delighted in the occupation for its own sake. He was something of a student of human nature, as all those who live by their wits must be of necessity, and the small services he was called upon to give brought him into contact with new varieties of men. Archie was new to him, and in the beggar's opinion immeasurably more amusing than anyone he had seen yet. In modern parlance he would be called a sportsman, this low-bred old ruffian who had lost his legs, and who was left to the mercy of his own ingenuity and to the efforts of the five dumb animals which supplemented his loss. He had, all honour to him, kept his love of life and its chances through his misfortune. And though he did not know it himself, it was his recognition of the same spirit in Flemington that made him appreciate the young man. His services to the state had not been important up to the present time. A few letters carried, a little information collected, had been the extent of his usefulness. But though he was not in their regular employ, the authorities were keeping a favorable eye on him, for he had so far proved himself capable, close-mouthed, and a very miracle of local knowledge. He sat in his cart, looking resentfully after Flemington, between the stems of the alders and the lattice of their golden-brown leaves, and though the one word tossed over the rider's shoulders did not tell him much, he determined he would not lose sight of Archie if he could help it. Drecken might mean anything from a night's lodging to a lengthened stay, but he would follow him as far as he dared, and set about discovering his movements. Skirling Waddy had friends in Brecken, as he had in most places round about, and certain bolt-holes of his own wherein he could always find shelter for himself and his dogs. But he did not mean to trust himself nearer than these refuges to Lord Balnillo, at any rate, not for a few days. Chance had relieved him of the letter for which he was responsible sooner than he expected, and at present he was a free man. He roused his team, tucked his pipes into their corner of the cart, and, guiding himself carefully between the trees, issued from the thicket like some ribald vision of goblinry escaped from the world of folklore. He turned towards Brecon and set off for the town at a brisk trot, the yellow dog straining at his harness and his comrades taking their pace from him. Every inch of the road was known to Waddy, every tree and tuft, every rut and hole, and as there were plenty of these last, he bumped and swung along in a way that would have dislocated the bones of a lighter person. The violent roughness of his progress was what served him for exercise and kept him in health. There were not many houses near the highway, but the children playing round the doors of the few he passed hailed him with shouts, and he answered them as he answered every one with his familiar wag of the head. When he entered Brecon and rolled past the high circular shaft of its round tower, the world made way for him with a grin, and when it was not agile enough to please him, he heralded himself with a shrill note from the chanter, which he had unscrewed from his pipes. Business was business with him. He meant to lie in the town to-night, but he was anxious to get on to Flemington's tracks before the scent was cold. He drove to the Swan Inn and entered the yard, and there he had the satisfaction of seeing Archie's horse being rubbed down with a wisp of straw. Its rider, he made out, had left the inn on foot half an hour earlier. So, with his meagre clue, he sought the streets and the company of the idlers, haunting their thievish corners, to whom the passing stranger and what might be made out of him were the best interests of the day. By the time the light was failing, he had traced Flemington down to the river, where he had been last seen crossing the bridge. The beggar was a good deal surprised. He could not imagine what was carrying Archie away from the place. In the dusk he descended the steep streets, running down to the Esk, and slackening his pace took out a short, stout pair of crutches that he kept beside him, 
using them as brakes on either side of the cart. People who saw Waddy for the first time would stand, spellbound, to watch the incredible spectacle of his passage through a town. But to the inhabitants of Brecon he was too familiar a sight for anything but the natural widening of the mouth that his advent would produce from pure force of habit. The lights lit here and there were beginning to repeat themselves in the water, and men were returning to their houses after the day's work as he stopped his cart and sent out that surest of all attractions, the first notes of the tod into the gathering mists of the riverside. By ones and twos the details of a sympathetic audience drew together round him as his voice rose over the sliding rush of the esk. Idlers on the bridge leaned over the grey arches as the sound came to them above the tongue of the little rapid that babbled as it lost itself in the shadow of the woods downstream. Then the pipes took up their tune. Jests and roars of laughter oiled the springs of generosity, and the good prospects of supper and a bed began to smile upon the beggar. When darkness set in, he turned his wheels towards a shed that a publican had put at his disposal for the night, and he and his dogs laid themselves down to rest in its comfortable straw. The yellow cur, relieved from his harness, stole closer and closer to his master and lay with his jowl against the pipes. Presently Waddy's dirty hand went out and sought the coarse head of his servant. Dog, he was muttering as he went to sleep. Perhaps in all the grim, grey little Scottish town no living creature closed its eyes more contentedly than the poor cur whose head was pillowed in paradise because of the touch that was on it. Morning found man and dogs out betimes and migrating to the heart of the town. Waddy was one who liked to get an early draft from the fountainhead of news, to be beforehand, so to speak, with his day. The Swan Inn was his goal, and he had not got up the hill towards it when his practiced eye, wise in other men's movements, saw that the world was hurrying along, drawn by some magnet stronger than its legitimate work. The women were running out of their houses, too. As he toiled up the steep incline, a figure burst from the mouth of a wind and came flying down the middle of the narrow way. "'Hey, what ails ye, man? What's ahind ye?' he cried, stopping his cart and spreading out his arms as though to embrace the approaching man. The other paused. He was a pale, foolish-looking youth whose progress seemed as little responsible as that of a discharged missile. "'There's Fecton!' he yelled, apparently addressing the air in general. "'Fecton?' "'Aye, there's Fecton at Montrose this hour, sign. "'Div ye no hear them, ye deef muckle swine?' continued the youth, rendered abusive by excitement. The two stared in each other's faces, as those do who listen. Dull and distant, a muffled boom drove in from the coast. A second throb followed it. The youth dropped his raised hands and fled on. Waddy turned his dogs and set off down the hill without more delay. Here was the reason that Archie had left the town. It was in expectation of this present disturbance on the coast that he had slipped out of Brecon by the less frequented road round the basin. He scurried down the hill, scattering the children playing in the kennel with loud imprecations and threats. He sped over the bridge, and was soon climbing the rise on the farther side of the esk. If there was fighting going on, he would make shift to see it, and Montrose would be visible from most of his road. Soon he would get a view of the distant harbour, and would see the smoke of the guns whose throats continued to trouble the air. Also, he would get forward unmolested, for there would be the width of the basin between himself and Lord Balnillo. He breathed his team when he reached the top of the hill, for he was a scientific driver, and he had some way to go. He cast a glance down at the place he had left, rejoicing that no one had followed him out of it. When he was on his own errands, he did not like company, preferring, like most independent characters, to develop his intentions in the perfect freedom of silence. When he drew near enough to distinguish the venture, 
a dark spot under the lee of Ferryden, he saw the white puffs of smoke bursting from her, and the answering clouds rising from the island. There had been no time to hear the rumours of the morning before he met the pale young man, or he would have learned that a body of Prince Charles's men under Ferrier had left Brecon last night, whilst he lay sound asleep in the straw among his dogs. He could not imagine where the assailants had come from, who were pounding at the ship from Inchbrayock. The fields sloped away from him to the water, leaving an uninterrupted view. He pressed on to the crossroads at which he must turn along the basin shore. From there on, the conformation of the land and the frequent clumps of trees would shut out both town and harbour from his sight until he came parallel with the island. He halted at the turning for a last look at the town. The firing had ceased, which reconciled him a little to the eclipse of the distant spectacle. Then he drove on again, unconscious of the sight he was to miss, for unsuspected by him, as by the crowd thronging the quays of Montrose, the French frigate was creeping up the coast, and she made her appearance in the river mouth just as Waddy began the tamer stage of his journey. The yellow cur and his companions toiled along at their steady trot, their red tongues hanging. The broadside from the French ship rang inland, and the beggar groaned, urging them with curses and chosen abuse. His intimate knowledge of the neighbourhood led him to steer for the identical spot on which Flemington, crouched in his wind-bush, had looked down on the affray, and he hoped devoutly that he might reach that point of vantage while there was still something to be seen from it. Silence had settled on the strait once more. Not far in front a man was coming into sight, the first creature Waddy had seen since leaving Brecon, whose face was turned from the coast. He seemed a person of irresolute mind, as well as of vacillating feet, for every few yards he would stop, hesitating, before resuming his way. The beggar cursed him heartily for a drunkard, for, though he had a lively sympathy with backsliders of that kind, he knew that accurate information was the last thing to be expected from them. Before the wayfarers had halved the distance between them, the man stopped, and sitting down by the tumble-down stone dyke at the roadside, dropped his head in his hands. As the cart passed him a few minutes later, he raised a ghastly face, and Skirling Waddy pulled up, astounded, with a loud and profane exclamation as he recognized Flemington. Though Archie had been glad to escape from the beggar yesterday, he was now thankful to see anyone who might pass for a friend. He tried to smile, but his eyes closed again, and he put out his hand towards the dyke. "'I'm so devilish giddy,' he said. Waddy looked at the cut on his head and the stains of blood on his coat. "'Ye've gotten a rare dunt,' he observed. Archie, who seemed to himself to be slipping off the rounded edge of the world, made no reply. The other sat eyeing him with perplexity and some impatience. He did not know what he wanted most, to get to Montrose or to get news out of Flemington. The dogs lay down in the mud. Flemington kept his hand to his eyes for a minute, and then lifted his head again. "'The ship has surrendered,' he said, speaking with difficulty. "'I have been on the high ground watching. She struck her flag, a French frigate.' He stopped again. The road on which he sat was whirling down into illimitable space. The other took in his plight. His coat, torn in his struggle with Logie, was full of wind prickles, and the wet mud was caked on his legs. His soft, silky hair was flattened on his forehead. "'Ye've been fectin' yourself, my lad,' said Waddy. "'Where hae ye been?' "'There's a rebel force on Inchbrayock,' said Archie, with another effort. "'I have been on the island. Yes, I've been fighting. A man recognized me. A man I saw at... on the road by Balnillo. They will be hunting me soon, and I have papers on me they must not find, and money, all the money I have. God knows how I am to get away. I must get to Aberbrothock. 
"'What was you saying about the French?' In broken sentences and between his fits of giddiness, Archie explained the situation in the harbour, and the beggar listened, his bristly brows knit, his bonnet thrust back on his bald head, and his own best course of action grew clear to him. Montrose would soon be full of rebel soldiers, and though these might be generous audiences when merry with wine and loose upon the streets, their presence would make him no safer from Lord Balnillo. Wattie knew that the judge's loyalty was beginning to be suspected, and that he might well have friends among the prince's officers, whose arrival might attract him to the town, and to serve Archie would be a good recommendation for himself with his employers, to say nothing of any private gratitude that the young man might feel. "'Bide you where you are!' he exclaimed, rousing his dogs. "'Lad, I'll hack to carry ye out to this and dod. We'll need a our time. Not far from them a spring was trickling from the fields, dropping in a spurt through the damp mosses between the unpointed stones of the dyke. The obedient dogs drew their master close to it, and he filled a battered pannikin that he took from among his small collection of necessities in the bottom of the cart. He returned with the water, and when Archie had bathed his head in its icy coldness, he drew a whisky bottle from its snug lair under the bagpipes and forced him to drink. It was half full, for the friendly publican had replenished his store before they parted on the foregoing night. As the liquid warmed his stomach, Archie raised his head slowly. "'I believe I can walk now,' he said at last. "'You'll need to try,' observed Waddy dryly. "'You'll no can ride with me. Come awa, Maester Flemington.' "'Will I gi'e ye a skellock o' the pipes to help ye alang?' "'In God's name, no!' cried Archie, whose head was splitting. He struggled on to his feet. The whisky was beginning to overcome the giddiness, and he knew that every minute spent on the high road was a risk. The beggar was determined to go to Aberbrothnock with Archie. He did not consider him in a fit state to be left alone, and he counselled him to leave the road at once and to cut diagonally across the high ground, whilst he himself, debarred by his wheels from going across country, drove back to the crossroads and took the one to the coast. By doing this, the pair would meet, Flemington having taken one side of the triangle, while Watty had traversed the other two. They were to await each other at a spot indicated by the latter, where a bit of moor encroached on the way. As Waddy turned again to retrace his road, he watched his friend toiling painfully up the slanting ground among the uneven tussocks of grass with some anxiety. Archie laboured along, pausing now and again to rest, but he managed to gain the summit of the ridge. Waddy saw his figure shorten from the feet up as he crossed the skyline, till his head and shoulders dropped out of sight like the topsails of a ship over a clear horizon. He was disappointed at having missed the sight of so much good fighting. Archie's account had been rather incoherent, but he gathered that the rebels were in possession of the harbour, and that a French ship had come in in the middle of the affray, full of rebel troops. He shouted the information to the few people he met. He turned southward at the crossroads. Behind him lay the panorama of the basin and the spread of the rolling country, Brecon, the Esk, the woods of Monrummon Moor, stretching out to Forfar and northward, the Grampians lying with their long shoulders in the autumn light. His beat for begging was down there across the water and round about the country between town and town, but though his activities were in that direction, he knew Aberbrothock and the coast well, for he had been born in a fishing village in one of its creeks and had spent his early years at sea. He would be able to put Archie in the way of a passage to Leith without much trouble, and without unnecessary explanations. Archie had money on him and could be trusted to pay his way. He was the first to reach the trysting place, and he drew up, glad to give his team a rest. At last he saw Archie coming along with the slow, careful gait of a man who was obliged to consider each step of his way separately in order to get on at all. 
"'Sit ye doon!' he exclaimed as they met. "'If once I sit down, I am lost,' said Archie. "'Come on.' He started along the road with the same dogged step, the beggar keeping alongside. They had gone about half a mile when Flemington clutched at a wayside bush and then slid to the ground in a heap. Wattie pulled up, dismayed, and scanned their surroundings. To let him lie there by the road was out of the question. He could not tell how much his head had been injured, but he knew enough to be sure that exposure and cold might bring a serious illness on a man in his state. He did not understand that the whisky he had given Archie was the worst possible thing for him. To the beggar it was the sovereign remedy for all trouble of mind or body. He cursed his own circumscribed energies. There was no one in sight. The nearest habitation was a little farmhouse on the skirts of the moor, with one tiny window in its gable end making a dark spot high under the roof. Waddy turned his wheels reluctantly towards it. Unwilling though he was to draw attention to his companion, there was no choice. End of chapter 14